I think we sometimes, by focusing on what someone can't do and trying to remediate it or help them do it, we're missing what they're bringing. Welcome to the B-Pod. I am your host, Louis B. And today I'm absolutely thrilled to have Elizabeth Schrader talking about her experience with music therapy, um, working with people who are labeled as disabled, being a parent in society, and ultimately um, analyzing systems that could use to be changed and working towards that. Welcome to the B-Pod. I am Louis B. And I am really pumped to be here today with Elizabeth Schrader. Elizabeth, thank you for being here. Um, I just want to start... So, like, the the reason that we know each other, essentially, is because we both have kids. Like, that was kind of our initial connection. Um, you have your little one, I have mine, and, and they're buddies. Um, and one thing that I've reflected on that I would just like to kind of get your perspective is, like, I feel like I really didn't know Elizabeth until, or I really didn't know Ella until I got to know Bren, you know, because I just kind of assumed, like, oh, this is what a one-year-old is and does, you know, this is just the way it is. And then there was this other little guy in our life who was just kind of less of a freight train and sort of more thoughtful and articulated, <laughs> you know, and just a totally different person. And I was like, wow, my daughter actually has some personality traits, you know, that are like <laughs> variable. <laughs> yes, she does. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Cause, and that was our kind of, that's how we initially met. Yeah, no, I appreciate thinking about that time um, when they were younger because they're Almost, Ella's four now, Brent will be four soon. Yeah, I think it makes me think of what you're doing here with this podcast, actually, is we really, we know what it's like to be ourselves, kind of, if we choose to reflect and engage. Yeah. Um, and we know a couple people probably better than we know others, but we really don't have a full understanding of the human experience, and we never will. So it's really neat to get to know other little kids or other people, you know, of various ages. Just be like, oh yeah, that's a different way to be human. That's that's equally valid. <laughs> Ella can have like really clear opinions of the things she wants and Bren can be like, oh, whatever, just uh, put it in front of me. That's changing, by the way. Once he hit three, then he started to go through that developmental phase. But both are, you know, we need everybody. So Yeah. yeah. In, and in some ways, just to know ourselves by knowing other people, I guess. I think that that's one of the most fascinating things you talked about, this like human experience, where it's like you never see yourself. You know what I mean? If you were to see yourself how I see you, you'd probably be shocked. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, like to me, it's like, oh, this person is an adult. <laughs> you know, she actually has a shit. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> not only that, but one thing that you said to me that, that stuck with me and is it was earlier on and you were talking about this um this relationship between movement in small kids and language development i believe mm -hmm. and i just found that to be really fascinating and i'm curious if you could just talk about that relationship a little bit oh well, there are um the ways that the way that development begins really for you know e even in infants is they get to learn to move their bodies independently. So one of the things that I've thought about, and this maybe have, was what we were talking about, and I'm remem not remembering the specific conversation, is um, so there are these uh, primitive reflexes that babies are born with that are kind of like the building blocks for movement. Um, and they're, um, but they're autonomic. They're not, they're not controlled movement. So you see this, if you can imagine a small baby who gets startled, their arms might go out and their eyes might get big and they gasp a little bit. Um, that's their, their startle reflex. And that's their body moving. Um, and then when, when they're given freedom to move, they learn to move it in an intentional way. They'll bring their hands up to their face and look at it. Um, they'll um, kind of follow their eyes, they'll follow their arm. That's actually based on a different um, reflex. But the idea is that these form kind of a blue like an initial blueprint but that the um, babies and children will move past them and get to intentionally move their bodies and feel like they have control um, and sometimes with these reflexes also comes like the startle one is a it's a startle response so there's this whole emotional process that happens so if a kid or a person doesn't work through those as a child which happens for a variety of reasons whether it's environmental or personality or whatever um, 
these reflexes can stay. And I do, I had, I um, had some students who, when we, we looked at that, they were kind of getting, you know, they were uh, anxious, had a hard time focusing, um, kind of uh, maybe a teacher or a parent, or even they would say, ah, ADHD or ADD, or yeah. maybe, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm not trying to say that this is the, this is the solution or the cause for all of, um, you know, differences. I think people are different and valid and, um, however they are. Also, it's interesting to do some of these reflex assessments and see, um, I had one eighth grader who we were doing them and he could, um, uh, when we were doing the assessment, I was basically trying to almost trigger it to see if that re- reflex was still controlling his responses and he wasn't, you know, having these startle responses. And he described it. He's like, oh, I just, I, I couldn't breathe. My, and his, his, like, he had a physical, his arms weren't up. Wow. And he, it, it was very interesting. He's like, oh, I was really stressed out and I couldn't breathe. And um, so that for him was getting kind of triggered throughout the day by the kinds of things that trigger little babies, like sudden changes in light or sound or you know so there's there's things that can be done to help someone you know work through some of that stuff if um if it's if that's there for them but yeah so I think the importance of movement um free movement playful movement is is really important in school I mean that's one of the things that I think is really fun about the current music classes we do is like and this is you know, early childhood is such a fun time because I don't need the kids to do anything in particular. Like, I want you to move, but move how you want to move, you know? So there's no, like, get up and move. It's like some kids are just kind of bouncing while they're sitting, and some are running and running and running or twirling, or um, it's it's a time for them to get to be uh, be themselves and move in a way that feels comfortable to them, um, surrounded by adults who are playing and having fun and kind of modeling that too yeah and, and what elizabeth's referring to is the um, music together classes that she facilitates in the park for what was the age group on that that you're open to yeah birth to five birth to five and yeah i've participated in those and it is it, it, it's really nice that it's free form like that and and, it, and yeah it was it was awesome just to see ella's um relationship with music change as a result of that as a result of those first couple sessions just like humming through the song and music is an important part um of our relationship too mine and ella's because uh i guess i i don't i'm I'm not really into like kids music versus adults music and so like ella listens to what i listen to you know and we just had actually a a pretty interesting discussion because I've been on this Neil Young record that he made tonight's the night that he made uh, the opening song. He talks about Bruce Berry, his a roadie who died, you know, and, and Ella wow. just just was asking me questions like, "Who is this guy that he's talking about?" And I, I was actually able to tell her like, uh, "This man wrote a song about his friend who died, you know, and he yeah. processed it by making this song." And she just started, you know, thinking about, you know, <laughs> about that dynamic, which yeah. was just crazy to share that experience, yeah. you know, and so. I mean, yeah, let's let's go there. So you, you said you started out your education career with a degree in music therapy and with work in music therapy, correct? Yeah, yeah. So why, why would a person choose to do such a thing? Oh, well, for, you know, I was starting, when I started undergrad, I was fresh out of high school, and the thing that I knew was that I loved music and I wanted to be able to keep making music. I didn't have a lot of formal music training, but it was, it's always for me personally been an important way I processed emotions, um, whether by music listening or singing in choir or playing piano. Um, I knew that that was something that personally I wanted to be able to keep doing. Um, and I learned about music therapy after I started college at, and it it was kind of lucky that I think at the time, UW-Eau Claire, where I went, um, was the only school that had a, or it was only UW system school that had a music therapy program. And I kind of thought like, oh, so you just like play music and make people feel better. And I felt like that, I felt like it was a little cheesy and I didn't really buy in until I did a practicum at a nursing home. And we were um, working on the, uh, with folks who were experiencing dementia and Alzheimer's. And our task was we were like uh, paired up as students and we were given a range of motion exercise. 
which is really important for folks to like move their body and maintain physical movement and health. You're talking um, about people on the older side of the spectrum yes. now? Yeah. Yep. Be, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And all of us really, but it's harder as you get older, right? Um, and especially when your um, experience of the tangible physical reality is different from, you know, what it used to be for them. Um, so we were supposed to pair this range of motion exercise with some music and get, get them engaged. And my friend and I did, a, um, we presented one and I was working with this lady while we were presenting the song and singing. And I couldn't, like, she would have kept showing me her button. And we did, I should say, we chose a recording of, like, in the mood um, and had some action to go with it. And she just didn't engage. And I was like, oh, this isn't working at all. And then the next group went, and they sang the song, Let Me Call You Sweetheart, this, like, old song. And they said, like, they had to move your arms, like, call your lover to you, like this. And I thought, well, that's a silly visual. And I thought, okay, let's see what happens. And this lady I was working with who had been handing me her glasses and showing me her button started singing all the words, crying, and doing the range of motion exercise. (laughs) And I was like, I don't know what's happening here. But she is connecting with this in a way where it is definitely able to improve her health because she's having this this really powerful experience with this song and with the present reality, I will say people have, we all have autonomic responses to music. So like when we hear something and process it as music, separate from speech, it impacts our entire brain. Um, initially, even before we're really paying attention to what's happening, it, it can impact our heart rate, our respiration, yeah. all of that yeah. stuff, all those autonomic processes. It has, the music itself has an impact on our emotions and then once we engage with it cognitively it impacts those cortical areas and then oftentimes especially if there's some kind of memory attached or a feeling response to what we're thinking about it has a second effect on your emotions so music has like this my professor used to say double whammy effect on your emotions so to be really thoughtful if you are a sensitive person like myself yeah, <laughs> about, like, yeah. what i'm putting in my like how i'm affecting my own emotions during the day yeah and one, one thing that i've experienced is when i've had like songs or records that essentially have been like because that's i just kind of get on kicks and so like sometimes i'll have like a record where it was like i listen to this like in a concentrated period of time all yeah. the time and then when it comes back later and it puts you back it's like oh, oh man Oof. and sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's like no like, <laughs> i don't 100%. need to go back yes exactly like i actually had a, an album and i feel bad for so we had a home birth, or I had a home birth, and uh, my midwife uh, also loves Boney Bear. I love Boney Bear. I'm from Eau Claire, so, like, you kind of have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, so his Boney Bear, Boney Bear album, which I think is just so beautiful, was one that I could relax into. And actually, as I was trying to prepare music for myself before birth, I was like, what albums, what what can I put together where I can just relax into it? Now, you can do that by practicing ahead of time, but I'm kind of lazy. So I just chose an album that already did that for me. But then I listened to it like five or six times <laughs> while I was in labor. And then I could not I could not listen to it um, for a few years after without being like, oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's when Brent was born. Like, oh, my gosh. And then I feel bad because I'm like, oh, Christy, I hope I didn't wreck that album for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, man. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's a lot to be said about, about the whole birth thing. But I want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier, essentially about choosing your inputs. You know, I think a lot of yeah. people think about this in terms of like food. Right. But I think it is. For me, I, I very much take seriously what I'm taking in, be it news, be it podcasts, be it music. And I think honestly, and we've had this conversation once before. I remember you telling me that you had a moment, you know, when you had some time to yourself and you found yourself like scrolling and just being like, no, <laughs> I'm not doing like this yeah. is not going to spend my time. Oh, yeah. And I would like to touch on that a bit because that's something that I, I think about a lot. And I like one of the, one of the, re- like the main reason that I can be effective in what I'm trying to do is because. I don't have the same distractions that a lot of people, a lot mm-hmm. other people have. You know, I, I'm, I don't get dragged into that. And I'm curious if you remember that or if you have any insights on that, that moment when you were like, what am I doing here? Oh, yeah. I do remember. Um, so I have always had a, like, mostly a hate relationship with Facebook. I think this was probably a Facebook 
thing, but I felt I had some, um, you know, FOMO and people do events on Facebook fear and of that, missing yeah, out. fear of missing out. Um, and it was after Bren was born, it was before the pandemic hit, he was probably six months old and I had come back from something and I had a few minutes before I got to see Bren or, you know, it was kind of this like this little space I had for myself. It was during a nap, a nap Which is important. That, that space becomes really important. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And it's so, like, before I became a parent, I didn't realize how much time I had. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I had so all the in-between times. All, like, this is so little time when you have an infant and a kid in general. But, um, and I found myself scrolling through Facebook. I was like, yeah, it was this. Like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? There's this giving me nothing positive. To be honest, like I, I often had anxiety responses to it or like just a little like stress. Um, yeah. And then yeah. I, but it was somehow still addictive. Um, and I was like, okay, I think I'm officially done because I had been on and off and on yeah. and off before yeah. um, as I had seen it, how it had affected particular relationships or habits that I didn't like. And then I'd come back on and I'm like, okay, I've worked through that. Mm-hmm. I can engage with it a little bit better. But then it just became this like, I don't think I need to engage at all. Like, of course I don't. Um, I can freely choose that. And so I just, I yeah, that was the last time I was on it. And luckily, it was before the pandemic hit and before the 2020 election. Um, so I missed, I, I it was wonderful. I got to miss yeah. all of that. And I'm so glad because I don't think that... Um, that much positive came from... I mean, when people are monetizing your attention or when companies are monetizing your attention, yeah. not, not mm-hmm. much good is going to come from yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we talked about, you know, music and capitalism, advertisements too, obviously. It's just, it's it's masterful. And the monetization of our attention has gotten to the point that, thankfully, I, I, I've never gotten addicted to the scroll. And, and as people... Because I think earlier on, it, like the algorithms weren't as effective, but I had have people that I respect very much have told me, like, I'm addicted to Instagram. I get on, I can't mm-hmm. get out, you know, and they mm-hmm. know it. And I'm just like, okay, I'm not even going to open that door, you know. Yeah. I treat it like a burning house. It's like I put content out there. I go on there to do the bare minimum of what I need to do, and I get out. Um, that's, a good, that's a good strategy. Get, yeah, get out. And it, it's just the mindfulness. Like you said, like you said, you identified this anxiety that it caused. And for me, it's like every second I spend on here, I just feel worse, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and it's taking away, like, it's kind of this, I don't want to, um, I also don't want to negate that there are beneficial things that can mm-hmm. come from it, mm-hmm. so I recognize I'm, you know, speaking from my experience, and, uh, you know, I don't want to minimize other people's, if they've had really positive and important experiences, yeah. like, you know, the ability to share live news from people who are experiencing it instead of from it, how it's framed later and after the fact you know like it can be really important for people who aren't represented by the way stories are framed um so i i certainly you know i'm not trying to say it's all bad um but and now that i've talked about that so much i forgot where i was actually going but i do um oh i think it gives an, an illusion of a connection i think yeah you know you feel connected because you're like oh yeah i saw but you didn't actually talk to the person. You're like, oh, I saw that you went to Green Bay last week. How did that go? Like, it's kind of a weird, but how, and how often do we actually have follow-up conversations about what we see? Like, so it's kind of this illusion of a, of a connection that's somehow like addicting, but not, but not an actual meaningful interaction with another human being, which we all really, really need. Mm-hmm. And, and it's really hard. Um, and I think, you know, the pandemic really showed, like the, the time when we were all, you know, um, separated from each other um, demonstrated how much we really need that, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and then to after afterwards, I mean, that was another reason not to go back to the music classes, but that was... When I was thinking about doing the class, I was like, you know, we all need this. We need to be come together again yeah. and play and laugh and sing and play with our kids and just be in a, and share a space together. Um, yeah. And I, uh, 
it, it, it creates like almost sort of like a hollowness or like a hunger that just doesn't quite get satiated. You know, it's kind of like eating eating sugar or something. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like I'm not really satisfied. Like it kind of just like a little bit of a endorphin boost, but then ultimately unsatisfying. With regard to the music yeah, class and yeah. movement, one thing that I uh, um, identify even as an adult is I've, I've just realized lately that when I get into a play space, like an ultimate frisbee field or like a mm-hmm. pickup football game, or I just love to put myself in places where I can just yell. Like I just, like not in an aggressive <laughs> way, but I just love to be in a place where I can just let loose. And I just realized like, even as an adult, I wonder how that's tied into my development in the oh, day to day, you know, like the space, like you said, people come together and, and frankly, whenever we're there, like I'm envious of the way of the kids, you got all these kids just going nuts and then all these adults kind of like, just like tightly like scooting around and it's just like, I'm a little envious. It's like, when did I lose that ability to freely embody my body, right. you know? No, I think about that a lot, how, I mean... Sometimes one of the conflicts when parenting is watching my child be, this is going to sound silly, be so free and then wonder, oh, and, and then overthink it. Like, oh, is he bothering people? How do I, you know, oh, like, man, and yeah. then you're like, no, 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 wait, 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 let him be free. He gets to be free if people are having a, you know, he's not, as long as he's not hurting anybody or himself or, yeah. you know, like if safety parameters are covered and, yeah. um, and not, yeah, uh, then it's, it's up to, if people have a concern, they can talk to me, but I don't need to, I can, I can let him enjoy being free and not put my own con- social awkwardness or what do other people expect onto him. Yeah. That is he, a, will, he will learn that. Yeah. Middle school, you know, yeah. middle school, he will get this, like, he will understand social pressure at some point. Can I, how can I release or fr- keep him free from that as long as possible? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think that, that that's an important consideration. I know for me, like, it's kind of like, if somebody's going to have an issue with a beautiful, blue-eyed, curly-headed boy <laughs> coming up into their space, you know, they can talk to me about it. But I have, and I've, it's it's sad for me to see. Like, I saw at the coffee shop, you know, there's these people, and this kid's trying to run around like Ella always does, you know, uh-huh. and like, and they just kind of keep, like, plopping him back and putting him in front of the tablet. And I finally told him, I was like, hey, he's not bothering us. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, it's kind of not like, he's in, he's like, injecting his freedom into the rest of us so like it's okay to just let him be and I've that's something that I've struggled with too as a parent though is just this like I think a lot of people parent in ways that is more based on their own perceptions of judgment on themselves you know and it's just to me that's I try not to do that you know it's like Mm -hmm. am I am I parenting for Ella's sake or for my own and I understand people could see me and be like oh you're a you're a lax father that isn't taking the amount of care to discipline your child it's like yeah maybe but also maybe I think that uh, free movement is what she needs and what we all need a little bit. Right. And if you know that that's at, at that developmental stage, that's so important. Like, why are you asking them to be someone other than who they are? You yeah. Know, they'll have plenty of time to sit. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be sad when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be sad when it happens. Mm-hmm. So when you... You sent me an email where you kind of talked about your educational past. And you said music therapy, and you used this language. Your, your resume is very impressive, by the way. Oh, gosh. This is very confusing, maybe. Like, what is this? Story? It's like publications, God. But oh. anyway, <laughs> anyway, but you, you used the phrase, working with those we elect to call disabled. And I would like for you to expand on that, that choice of words a little bit. Those we elect to call disabled. Yeah. Um... So I think uh, ability and disability is really framed, um, like there's this, uh, how do I say this? Those terms are given by people who are, who consider themselves abled, right? Um, and why, uh, the, a disability implies that someone can't, can't do a particular thing um, and it's something that we have, we or society has determined is like an important thing to be able to do. But there are several hundreds of things I cannot do <laughs> or don't have the capacity to do that. And I'm not decided as, you know, disabled. And part of it is, you know, for personal reasons, um, one of the big, uh, um, kind of an important part of my life was uh, right out of high school, starting college, I worked at um, a group home for 
um, again, folks we would call disabled. Um, and I was also going through some, you know, social changes, having some relationship changes where I felt like people weren't being honest and were playing social games, which for me has always been a, a frustrating trigger. Like, just tell me, just tell me what you're like, be honest. I don't care if you think it's going to hurt my feelings. At least I know what you're experiencing and then mm-hmm. I can learn, you know, those kinds of feelings. And as I was working with these adults, um, they were, they happened to be, and I'm not trying to say like everyone who is, has a disability label is like this, but these particular adults were beautifully honest with me. Mm. Um, I remember my friend Gary, if he was mad, he would shake his fist at me. He, and he did not speak, he, he was deaf and was not in, um, he was institutionalized as a child didn't gain to like language skills that um, would allow him to communicate everything he was thinking to me. So he used syllables like buh, 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 and gagging. And he would shake his fist at me. And I'd be like, you are mad. What's happening? Oh, okay, thank you. I'm glad you told me. Let's figure this out. You know, like you want, you wanted to go to, to bed or you wanted to go do this thing outside, you know, or if, and, and when he was, he was also incredibly affectionate and he was so appreciative. He would give hugs. Like if you help if you helped him in a certain way or did something with him that he appreciated, he would show you his appreciation. There was it was just so beautiful to interact with an adult that way. Um that I I get um you know, are we all a little more I don't know what's the word connection disabled then like are we honesty disabled like we can't yeah, be wow. honest with each other wow. we can't we can't um just say what we need or we can't just accept what other people say that they need you know like why uh, I don't know I guess what I'm trying to say is uh I think everybody has things that they can contribute that are equally valid to everyone else and equally important and um and I I think we sometimes by focusing on what someone can't do and trying to remediate it or help them do it, we're missing what they're bringing. We're missing this beautiful, and I'm not saying that you can't do both, right? Like, oh, it, lang- language and communication is important. Let's make sure people can interact, you know? Like, but also um, to be open to beautiful gifts that people are, are bringing regardless of ability disability status or label wow yeah yeah so that's kind of why I, I'm a little bit like I, I hesitate to use it because I also know how it's framed and and, and when you start looking at things like um, I don't know things like IQ tests and even the bell curve uh, to which is where a lot of like oh outliers are outliers on, on one end are determined disabled like then it's kind of it, you know the history of that stuff is it's it just feels um, kind of gross <laughs> and yeah. not and not useful. Like who who are we to determine what's an what's a norm? What's a typical human? Like we're all individuals. Sure, there's going to be a more typical way to behave, but just just because someone behaves in a different way or you know doesn't mean that they're I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, they no, should be but, excluded or not, um, or or be made to conform to the rest of us. Yeah, which is kind of like I don't know. Let people be who they are, and 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 look for the beauty and good that they are bringing already. And maybe you yourself may get a chance to change and grow, and then if they also want to change and grow in a certain way, that you can help. Great. But it doesn't need to be this. Like, and I feel like there's this weird dynamic of like, um, I will help you, right? And here I'm a special ed teacher and a music therapist. Like, yes, I've had, I've, I've adopted that wholeheartedly early on in my career. Like, I'm going to help. I didn't use the word fix, but if I'm being honest, fix would be in there, right? Like, I'm going to help, help you, help you. But, and this is a, this a thing people say all the time, right? But they've helped me so much more. And it sounds cheesy, but it's so true. Like, these interactions have shaped who I've become and taught me so much more about what it means to be human, what it means to love other people, what it means to accept yourself and to know yourself and communicate your needs 
in any way possible. Um, and I, yeah, so I, I do, I, I kind of push back against those terms a little bit and have, you know, you want to live in a world where everybody gets to be who they are and, um, and participate and appreciate, be appreciated and appreciate other people, I guess. Yeah. I've, I've never considered the concept of, uh, maybe we're honesty disabled, you know, I think that that, I think that in a lot of ways we may be friendship disabled. We talked, we talked about insecurities a little bit before we started this. And I think that, I think a lot of people are very lonely as a result of not being able to express the amount of honesty. And for me, one thing I I look for in a, in a friend is like, do you have the ability to tell me what you see? Because I can't see what's going on with myself. Yeah. You know, from the outside, do you actually have the ability to say, to shake your fist at me? Yeah. Like, dude, this isn't okay. <laughs> right. You know? And, and yeah, you, you just remind me, there's a, um, this, this man named, I think, Jean Venier, it, something like that. He has this podcast, The Wisdom of Tenderness, with Krista mm-hmm. Tippett. And he gives this anecdote. Mm-hmm. He started this organization working with, you know, people who have these special needs mm-hmm. or what have you. And he was like meeting with some other, you know, investor or something like that. And one of his, one of his people came in, you know, this guy with Down syndrome, just Down syndrome, just laughing and smiling and saying hi. And then, you know, and then the guy left and, and you know, and this investor was just like, oh my God, isn't that so sad? Oh my God. And he was like, no, he was like, yeah, he was, like, he was just like, what, what did, what did you see right there? You know, it's like this beam of sunshine comes in and you're saying that that's sad. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That, I mean. The sad part of that is the, the investor's inability to see joy, yeah. or to like expect to see, to see someone who doesn't fit their expectation and see it as a disappointment, as like some objective sad thing instead of like, why am I expecting something different? <laughs> yeah, and then we could ask ourselves, as parents even maybe like, if I were to have the choice, would I choose to have a child that was like happy and emotionally well or insanely intelligent you know oh. and maybe sociopathic or just <laughs> lonely or un- unable to connect you know and yeah. I think that that there's just like where's our value system on that yeah I mean I think about that with um oh if we want to touch education <laughs> I think about I think that a lot with uh, <laughs> and it's um I think about that in regards to the things we measure for our kids and we choose to require of our kids. And there's, you know, reading is super important. And I'll say it's an important life skill. You know, these are valuable life skills, reading or being able to take in information um, and math and science. Recently, a lot of schools have realized they need to start adopting like social emotional curriculum, which is good. Um, the tricky the really tricky thing is, and this is kind of how I, um, there are all the, all, everyone cares so much, but there are these systems, these like requirements often uh, imposed upon, like uh, imposed upon schools by outside forces, oftentimes like political hot topics or, um, I don't know, this kind of like race to like we want the best test scores in particular areas. And that kind of push schools to have to make, and teachers to have to make really weird decisions. Like one of the things at a middle school that I, that I um, was familiar with, um, they determined um, that they, they labeled things like music and um, art as enrichment activities. And also, the extra reading help for kids who were already taking English classes was enrichment activities. And so, um, because uh, those extra reading classes are like, there's like some state requirements, all this stuff, like there's like these requirements they have to fit in, they schedule them at the same time. So that these middle schoolers are getting English class, which maybe they enjoy, maybe they're, maybe it's stressful, I have no idea. And they also get this reading help, but then don't get to participate in art and choir. It's not because no one wants them to participate in art and choir. <laughs> it's like it's not the, it's not that 
um, people don't care and don't want uh, well-rounded I don't want to say well-rounded, that don't want kids to have a variety of experiences or get to engage in the thing they care about instead of the thing that's hard for them. Um, it's because of these systems that are just complex and that people, it's like, it's like a scheduling thing. Like, how are we going to get this kid this thing that they technically legally have to have, but there's only so many hours in the day and it has to happen within school hours. Like legally it can't happen after, you know, like it's, it's this weird, these, these systems that have run away from us that we don't um, really have that, have as much control as we could have, you know, and, and we don't always ask about those. It, it just becomes a, you know, and, and as someone who did teach, it is it, it, every day. It's like, okay, what's in front of me right now to be like, Oh, let's talk about this big system for teachers. They have the skills and ability to do it, but their days are so intense and full on every level. Like the work involved, the, the connecting with developing humans. Like, you know, it, it's really, it's intense work. And I'm, I'm just rambling a bit here, but I really think, um, I really think if teachers and communities and, you know, communities in which these schools are situated in had more agency over what they could choose to say is important or an individual families, individual kids could have a say and like, actually, I don't really want to do, I might get in big trouble over things. Actually, I don't really want to do the extra reading class this semester. I'd really like to do choir, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I'd really like to be able to do that. And maybe, you know, I'll, I'll work on reading on my own or you can give me this program, you know, like, just this kind of like recognizing that they're these full humans, but at, at, who, who should have, you know, at a time where they're exploring their identities, get a chance to have more agency. But if they're on this or heading towards a label of a disability or have a label of like needing extra reading stuff, oftentimes their options are more limited. Yeah, and I guess the question that comes to my mind is like, what are the impacts of <clears throat> somebody getting into choir and excelling at choir? Because I, I guess intuitively it seems to me as though, like when you find something that just kind of sets you on fire and you find a passion, like that is going to improve your reading somehow. <laughs> oh, oh, and there's so many skills. Because maybe then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I want to actually pick, pick up a book about you know, yeah. the history or whatever it is. A hundred percent. And even just the, like, you're, if you learn to read music, you're learning to read. You're, I mean, I'm not saying you can all of a sudden read words, but a lot of the similar skills, like your, um, the left to right, the eye, you know, following, um, following something from left to right, crossing the midline, like, um, reading the words underneath, like you're, you're getting a lot of that. And there's, um, and I don't, I can't cite it, but there is music ed research you know, as, as music educators have had to prove, they're like, we should be able to still be in school. We are an important part. They have to say, like, because we help reading, you know, like, there is that yeah. research to show it, though, too. So, like, um, it, it, it helps with the actual skill. It helps them, like you were saying, get interested in something that they maybe want to learn more about, and then reading would be a way they could do it. It helps, like, um, with feeling good about who you are and, and these kids have every right to feel good about who they are because who they are is good. Like they shouldn't have to feel like they're deficient and that, and, and so that's one of the, one of the things that my first year of teaching, which anyone who's taught know, I would assume and knows is like a year of hell. Um, very confusing. I, I remember doing a lot of reflecting during that year and I had some, a student with like a, uh, behavior IEP behavior um, individual individual education plan okay. so I um, what often what I was probably supposed to do was talk with him like all these strategies like okay why did you do that how can we make a plan so you don't do that and we did some of that the last half of the year I was like I'm teaching this kid ukulele this kid sees himself as a bad kid his classmates see him as a bad kid his teacher sees him as a troublemaker, right? I, and, you know, a complex, teachers have complex things. Like troublemaker who's like, oh my gosh, stop interrupting. <laughs> or, oh my gosh, just just do your work. Why do I have to like keep reminding you to do your work, right? You know, and I'm just like, okay, he needs to feel good about himself. And I just thought, let's see how he does with the ukulele because it's an easy instrument to teach. I shouldn't say that. Um, it's easy to get started on it. 
because uh, there's some really accessible first chords. And he picked it up almost instantly. Like, great rhythm. And I didn't know this about him. Um, and he ended up getting a ukulele. His grandma got him a ukulele. It became a thing. He, like, performed the end of the year. It became part of his identity for a little bit in middle school. And that is what... Um, that's what I wanted for him, not like that he could see himself as a ukulele player, right? But he could see himself as like, look at this cool thing I can do. Look at like, I, or and maybe even use it for self-expression or, or whatever. But so that he doesn't get this view of himself that everyone else is telling him, which is like, you're a bad kid. I mean, no one actually says that. And I don't mean to say that, but when you're... No, I understand. You know what I mean? Like those interactions throughout the day, we need to interrupt those so that kids can feel good about who they are. Yeah, and the um, the labeling and the classification, the assumptions that go along with that. I think about this a lot. Um, you're a bad kid, you're a troublemaker. I, I have my eye on it too. Um, I know for myself, I am I am a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> own it, yeah. <laughs> and it, and it's, it took me until I was... 32 earlier this year until I finally was able to say that's okay you know yeah. and I think it ties into what we talked about before with this classification of these quote-unquote disabilities as an absence you know because I think that every absence is also a presence mm-hmm. and I think that if there is a person you know if you could quantify it differently where it's like maybe this is a person that questions rules and authority and as somebody you know in a society that's supposed to be democratic you need those people that are going to oh, do that. 100%. You need those people. And I have a lot of respect for those people because I believe that I am one. And mm-hmm. I think that, um, and I think it ties, like with regard to what you're talking about, like art as enrichment, I just kind of think, I think there's a weird double standard where it's just like, we love art, but we hate artists. You know what I mean? And, and to all these yeah. people making these policies where it's like, oh, art is enrichment. It's like, well, is music medicine for you? You know, where do you think this comes from? And if this kid has just always said, like, oh, you're a troublemaker or whatever, instead of allowed to pursue what may be a gift for him, but instead if he's able to pursue that gift, then it's a gift to all of us because then you have somebody providing music that can be medicinal. And and, and maybe music that can cause some good trouble. <laughs> yeah. What is that? I think it's, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Poor People's Campaign. Reverend William Barber III always talks about making good trouble. Like, mm-hmm. we need troublemakers. We need people to stand up and say, this is what's going on. Like, not just to follow along with what's going on because more often than not these like we need we need big change in our world so that people you know i mean there's yeah there's there's a lot of big change we need to make so people can live and live in a a way where they have what they need and are connected to each other and connected to the to the world around them Um, yeah yeah there's a oh I, i wish i could remember oh i think his name's paul gorski um, he came to speak at, uh, it was my last year of teaching, and he came to speak at this um, counselor's convention, which I'm not a counselor, uh, but I was uh, at this school that I worked at for five years. We all wore several hats. <laughs> and yeah. I was, and at the time we didn't have a principal, and we didn't have a counselor, and we didn't have, and I was like the special ed teacher, so I was kind of pulled into a lot of stuff. So I got to go to this convention, and most of the people came up with like, would present it like oh here are some mindfulness strategies here's this kind of strategy here's this kind of strategy and those were helpful I don't always I don't always like them as much because I'm like okay like give me a strategy that's fine I can come up with strategies yeah um, but they were useful I didn't mean to I don't mean to knock them but I um, this is actually when I realized I wanted to go back to grad school um, <laughs> well Paul Gorski got up there and he and I don't remember what he said first but he had us all imagine a pep rally at a high school and he said you can imagine the pep rally you can think of everybody down on the gym floor all the enthusiasm all the excitement and then he's like now look up the top left of the bleachers or top right of the bleachers he's like there are going to be kids up there who are not participating he's like these kids and he said and then what do we do with these kids do we You know, how often are these kids like, hey, come on, come participate, come, you need to come, come down, sit by us here, like, what's wrong, why aren't you participating, why aren't you happy, why aren't you, why aren't you, why aren't you? He's like, these kids have really good information for us. He's like, they're not buying the propaganda the school is selling. (laughs) He's like, why not? Because maybe 
they have an idea of how our schools could be better. Maybe that they're not, their needs aren't being met there. They don't feel comfortable. And instead of saying, you should feel comfortable, here's how I'm going to let you know you are, ask them, like, what's, what's, wow. how could the school be better? What, what's missing? And I think, um, I don't know, I think that's like a really important posture when we see, you know, uh, when we see that there are people abstaining or cho- uh, choosing not to participate in something like that, not to assume something is wrong with them, but to say yeah. like, what, you know, what, why? Tell me. And being open to like learning and changing. Wow. Yeah, and you can, you can just see the kids too. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't even go to a typical public high school and I could see those kids. <laughs> like, I know. Because we had, I mean, I don't know. I went to a, a Lutheran high school. Yeah. And it, Anyways, that's a, that's a different podcast episode. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> but in a function of that, I think is also like, not everybody should feel comfortable at a pep rally because oh, it's a weird space. It's a weird space. It's a totally, I and mean, you're getting, you're intentionally amping people up to like, yeah, it's a very weird space. <laughs> yeah, and I think, like you said, appreciate, like, what can we learn from these people that have a bit of a different perspective? But, yeah, that, that's awesome. Like, it's not what are what are you doing wrong. It's what, you know, like, what's going on here? Yeah. And with regard to, you know, you talked about individual teachers just, like, having these crunches to get in, you know, to get to the things that we measure or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think, I guess my assumption is that, like, nobody goes into teaching by accident, right? Right. Like, and I've, I've talked to two different people over the course of the last few months that went through their whole teaching credentialing process and worked. One of them worked one year and said no. Sure. One of them worked three years and said no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, for the exact uh-huh. same reasons everybody can identify. One thing that I find in, in so many workspaces, there's this Alan Watts talk, which is crazy how far ahead of his time he was, where he's just talking about like a fundamental problem of society is that we value the symbol over, over the actual reality of it. Mm. You mm. see it everywhere. And that's why so many jobs have become disenfranchised because it's like, no, we're not actually talking about outcomes. We're talking about the symbol of outcomes, the numbers. You right. know, we're talking about right. numbers. Yeah. So what is, <laughs> what, like, what, what's the, I mean, I don't know. It just, it's just crazy to me how, how this manifests in different ways because essentially it's just like the actual child is less important than the number. Would that, is that? Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I, it's, it's so... It's interesting because it, I feel like it does still come from a good place. There are, you know, educational researchers trying to make sure kids have access to quality reading instruction. That's important, you know, quality instruction and making sure kids have access. Um, and and when there are the way that education is funded, there are definitely huge gaps in in access. Like if it's you know na- neighborhood community like. The property tax funds that school. Like, there's huge gaps. There's so there's what I'm trying to say is there's certainly value at looking at particular um, quant data. Mm-hmm. Um, what meaning we make from that is often, or if we see a struggling school, like these kids, are, like these test scores in this neighborhood are so much lower than these test scores. Well, I would say, um, and usually people try to find the problem or find in like individual teachers like oh the teacher didn't do it right or oh these students aren't smart enough or you know instead you know you can like really look at like well what is going what's going on what's going on here um and looking at the context of like the wealth inequality access and like kids aren't going to engage in school if it's not meeting their needs you know, that kind of stuff. So I think there's probably still value in looking, I don't know if it's test scores, but like trying to make sure that there's equity. Um, but yes, I would agree that that cannot tell you how individual kids are doing. And um, and it would be interesting instead of just looking at outcomes, being look at, you know, looking at things like what is the school like a, culturally and there are schools that do this they measure their they like have their kids uh, their students take surveys on like school climate school culture Mm. are they you know how do kids feel at school do they feel safe do they feel heard do they um have time do they feel like they can be themselves um how about teachers do they have time do they have time to um do the teachers have the resources they need to have like time to prepare their lessons and do their stuff or are they feeling like they have to um meet the needs so many needs beyond the classroom 
because a lot of um, our public services don't exist anymore. You know, there aren't, school is one of the few public goods that remain. So in communities that don't have access to a lot of, or kids don't have access to things due to like poverty, which we can't seem to want to actually address. Um, like, okay, now we need, we need to provide health care at schools. We need to provide mental health care at schools. We need to, and, but mm. in, in neighborhoods where oh, there, yeah. there's a lot of wealth, like those kids can access that already, you know? So like, so looking at these, looking at schools as really complex systems, um, and remembering when we see the numbers, not to blame people, not to be like, oh, those kids aren't as smart, or the teachers aren't very good, or, you know, like, to, to, to not blame, but to ask more questions. <laughs> yeah. And not lose sight, like you were talking about, not lose sight of the individual child who's moving through that experience. Yeah. Like, do they have what they need to be themselves and to feel safe and to feel valued and to feel like they have something that they can also offer in exchange, you know, to feel like they can give something and and be received and appreciated for who they are. Because isn't that like all what we all need? <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe so. Yeah, so unfortunately we're on a little bit of a time crunch here, but I just want to, and I'd like to have, have you back again for another conversation, but I, I would just like to talk about where you are at, right now as far as your trajectory because you were out of teaching for a little while and now it appears that you're going back for is it a master's degree uh phd phd yeah oh yeah and so why <laughs> like just with the last few minutes um why are you doing it and what would be your the outcome you're hoping for oh outcomes? man two good questions i'll start with the outcome because um that's the one I have the less clear handle. So I don't know what the outcome, I mean, hopefully I'll get, hopefully I'll finish the program. Um, there's the landscape of higher ed, like becoming a professor. It's all really tenuous. <laughs> um, I would say Madison's a good program, but I actually am more motivated by the work, uh, the work I did with my advisor during my master's program and to continue it um, than an actual particular outcome for myself. Nice, yeah, <laughs> um, awesome. And the, what is really it so um back in whatever 2012 2013 and I was a master's student and I was invited to be on this project that I didn't fully understand influenced by cultural historic activity theory if you want to read some really interesting thing and see seeing a lot of triangles and diagrams that seem kind of confusing read Yurio Engstrom's book on activity theory um expansive learning and learning what's not there and it's um now I'm just rambling but it's the experience I had was so formative for me and basically what it is instead of looking at we like to look sometimes at individual um, variables as being like magic bullet solutions to things like oh this is the curriculum that's going to change the game and all the kids are going to be able to suddenly read or you know like whatever um, activity theory looks like the unit of analysis is the activity or the object of the activity like the goal and recognizing that there are lots of people working towards the same object, lots of different stakeholders who want like a same the same thing, and um, and then how to structure participation and to structure um, kind of some collective learning about this activity among the people who are shaping the activity. Sorry, I'm using the word activity a lot. Um, so, for example, the project I got to work on. Um, we worked with a high school that cared about and that wanted to reduce the despair or the um, the disparity for their kids of color who were getting like lots of behavioral referrals where their the white kids were like not getting as many like mm -hmm. and um, so that was our object like okay let's look at this let's look at what's happening and so we um, brought in administrate the administrators um, teachers parents parents of kids who aren't represented in PTA, parents of kids who had, whose kids had behavioral struggles. We brought in some local community groups that, um, like boys and girls club type groups that worked with some of, some students who would have some of these behavior, like have a behavioral referral. And we asked the question like, what, 
what's the activity? What does it look like for a kid to get a behavioral referral? And Oof. like map out the system. Like what happens then? What happens? But it's really hard. The first three meetings, everyone was like, well, the solution is teachers need better training. The administrators were like, the, the teachers need better training. The teachers were like, that we need more time or the parents need to do this and the parents, but you know, like everyone just kind of thought someone else needed to do something different. And we all come in with, we all do this. We all have like solutions we think, but uh, would, would be useful. But what we ended up getting to do together is map out the activity. Be like, oh, okay, so when this happens, this kid gets a, this kid, this is what would constitute a referral. Oh, for respect, is respect even objective? Like, what does this mean? What, which, which type of respect? Like, you know, what can, it, or disrespect, I should say. Um, and then, like, the, then things came up where the special ed teacher's like, oh, yeah, we can't phone this room where they're going because the phones on our floor don't work. And the administrator's like, what? The floors? Like, the phones don't work? So all this stuff came up because we have this idea of how something is working, but we only really know our little part in it. So when you get everyone together and you learn, like, oh, this is actually what is happening, then you can say, do we want this to happen this way? And... Often, you know, the parents were like, no, we don't want to wait till the third referral before we're called. We want to be called right away when our kid's in the office. Yeah. You know, like, so then we, we designed a new system to implement. But then we weren't done. I mean, technically that phase of the project was done. It's, the hope is that this group, and it's not just like a focus group that provides opinions, but this, like, this group that's doing the work of mapping out a new system that then the school would implement would continue to revise it. And measure it. Like, is this working? Oh, oh, and because this all happens all the time, right? Like, like, like whack a mole. Like, this is helping this, but this other thing came up. We need to address. Yeah. Like this continuous learning. Um, this, yeah. So, uh, what was fun about that is I got to be in the early stages of implementing this project, and it was all very new, and we, I, I didn't know what I was doing, and it was it was like discovery by doing. And now the project is wrapping up, and it's really beautiful and exciting. And so when I get to go back, I'll start in the fall. I'll get to be involved in the analysis. And, nice. Um, wow. So I'll get and I and I just think that in our world um, today, where <clears throat> we do seem a little more siloed, whether it's because we can choose our friends through social media and only hear the things we want to hear, or you know, like there's the strong polarization to kind of like choose a side, even when it. There's no side to be chosen. You know, this, this yeah. framework allows people to say, no, actually, we're all on the same side because we care about this. Like, yeah. we all care about this. There's not a side. What's going on? And we can sort yeah. this out together and plan a new approach together. And then know we're, that's not even going to be enough. Like, we're, it's just like engaging people in this community work. And I think that is, that to me is beautiful. And um, I'm a little nervous about stats class in the fall. But I'm really excited to, to get a chance to, to do that because I knew when I heard Paul Gorski speak and all my colleagues were like, what is he saying? And, I was, and he was the one talking about the pep rally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, he's speaking my language. I need the school system to change. I can't just keep teaching in this. You know? And the teachers who do, I give them so much. Um, I have so much respect for them and love because they're seeing like I, my work is valuable. I'm meeting these kids where they are and I'm putting up with this BS. Yeah. You know? And that we need people doing that, and I just was like, I think I'm gonna take a different trajectory, and you know, I hope there is an outcome for a school if I get to partner with a school someday where they get to say, here's what's important for our kids. We want them, like we know that there are these legal requirements. We want them to get to do music, and reading. yeah, or we here's how we're gonna navigate through that instead of just accept the system that's handed to us. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I mean, that, that sounds, I know you got to get going. That sounds like awesome work. And I really appreciate that. It's like the outcome is secondary to the process and to the learning. Like that to me is a true, you know what I mean? A true undertaking. It's like, I don't know where it's going, but I know that I want to do it. And it just, I guess what stuck out to me is like being willing to be vulnerable enough to ask the right questions, to put down that self-defense and to say, hey, maybe there's things that I need to change or that we need to change, but we need to ask the question, like, if the outcome we want is based around the students, then what are we actually doing? And, yeah, I, I'm excited for you. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for having me on. This has been really, it's actually really nice to be asked these questions because it helps me be more reflective, too. So thanks yeah. for doing this. And we opened a lot of doors. <laughs> and I would, I would like to continue it again. But yeah, thanks a lot. That was yeah. a wonderful conversation. Very much appreciated. And 
Enjoy your time with the little guy when you go pick him up. <laughs> Will do. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> yep.